Good afternoon. My name is Nina Ponce, and I am the director here at the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research. As a land-grant institution, we would first like to acknowledge the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, that is the Los Angeles Basin and South Channel Islands. Thank you all for joining us for today's online seminar. Breaking down barriers faced by breast cancer patients in California. An estimated and projected 281,550 new cases of invasive breast cancer will be diagnosed in women this year, according to the American Cancer Society. Breast cancer is the most common form of cancer and the leading cause of cancer death among women in the U.S. In California alone, 30,650 individuals were diagnosed with the disease in 2019. Metastatic breast cancer, or breast cancer that has spread to a different part of the body, was the cause of death for a majority of the 4,620 breast cancer deaths in the state that year. Today's presentation will take a closer look at barriers to metastatic breast cancer care in California. Our presenters today are Dr. A.J. Scheidler, Director of Stakeholder Relations here at the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research and Coordinator of the National Network of Health Surveys, and Dr. Beth Glenn, my colleague, Professor at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health and co-director for community outreach and engagement at the UCLA Johnson Comprehensive Cancer Center. The webinar will walk through findings of a large study conducted in early 2020, which collected insights from individuals involved in the entire cancer care trajectory, including patients, caregivers, and providers. The study also pulled insights from a social media Twitter chat as well as various pieces of literature. More specifically, Dr. Scheitler and Dr. Glenn will discuss three vital aspects, referrals to clinical trials, removing hurdles in health insurance requirements, and access to palliative care. And they will suggest possible solutions for system or policy changes that can improve care for metastatic breast cancer patients. Today, we released information fact sheets covering these topics available in English, in Spanish, and Chinese. And we will share links to the reference publications in the chat section. Findings of the study were presented to our sponsor, the California Breast Cancer Research Program, and we thank you for your support. If you would like a PDF copy of today's presentation, please email the Center's Communications Department at healthpolicy.ucla.edu. So we have some upcoming events. This Friday, we will host a workshop on strategies in mitigating disclosure risks in disaggregated racial ethnic data. And this is part of our Addressing Health Equity Through Data Disaggregation Workshop Series, supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Also coming up on May 19th, our Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Data Policy Lab will launch a new California dashboard that looks at NHPI COVID-19 rates by county. We will be sending out an invite for this event next week. So now I'll turn it over to Dr. A.J. Scheitler to kick off today's Thank you, Dr. Ponce, and thank you everybody for joining us. Welcome to today's presentation. I want to uh, acknowledge um, our, my co-authors and co-collaborators on this project, uh, include, in addition to Dr. Glenn and Dr. Ponce, Dr. Riti Shimkata and Dr. Susan Babby, who both work here at the center with us. So <laughs> today's study builds on work that um, some of you may be aware that we did back in 2018 that looked at barriers to breast cancer care in California. And at that time, we found that there was a lot of system fragmentation that patients encountered, and there was a real desire to help uh, with navigating that whole space. 
uh, as many of us have unfortunately experienced, there are insurance issues and dealing with health benefits that impact care. Cost is a, a perennial issue with any healthcare topic. There are cultural and individual characteristics that we found that served as barriers. And where there's such diversity in California, we also have a lot of people who don't maybe have the medical English language that could really help them. And so those were the main barriers that we found. As Dr. Ponce noted in her opening, the California Breast Cancer Research Program came back to us and said, now look at those whose breast cancer has metastasized and look and see what similarities there are and what differences there are among that population. So those are the findings that we are gonna to present today. I'm gonna to start out with our study objectives, talk about the approach that we used and then go through key findings, both the themes of the barriers that people encountered and then the policy recommendations that we gleaned both from our uh, key informants and from the literature and the social media chat that we conducted. And then we will end up with some Q&A. So our objective from the California Breast Cancer Research Program was to identify the barriers that women with metastatic breast cancer encounter to getting not only care, but the best care that they can. And then to identify possible system or policy changes that could address some of these barriers and make care better. So our approach to this included five tasks. First, we identified the populations that we wanted to talk to, the patients themselves, of course, but also their clinical providers and those who are in non-clinical support services, such as those who run support groups, those who run, um, you know, connecting women to the different benefits that they can get, such as financial support or transportation support. Um, so we recruited through some existing networks we have from um, the past study. We also uh, went to uh, a, a, a metastatic breast cancer conference in at Los Angeles, and we talked to potential participants there, and then we asked participants to refer others. Some of our participants actually fell into more than one category. We had some physicians who then, who uh, themselves, uh, were diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer and then were on both the patient and the provider side. Um, there were also a lot of patients who, because of the needs that they saw during their treatment, start support service groups to fill gaps that they perceive. Uh, and we also tried to get a diverse uh, representation of the geographies in California to understand if there were differences depending on where you lived. We conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews with those um, key informants as I mentioned, we also participated in the seventh annual Metastatic Breast Cancer Conference hosted by Susan Komen. We both uh, presented the findings from our previous study at an information expo that we had and also identified um, uh, key informants who would participate in this round of the study. We conducted an extensive literature synthesis and a legislative scan to see what has been um, put forward already in policy to try to address some of the issues that these patients are experiencing. And then we uh, did something that was new and novel, but we think in hindsight, very effective. Um, there was a existing Twitter group that talks once a week about breast cancer and metastatic breast cancer and different topics. And so we went to them and said, can we participate? And can we ask a couple of questions of your participants and gathered such rich information, again, from a diverse setting of people, both providers and patients participated and it was an, um, an excellent contribution to this study. So now I'm going to walk through the key findings, the theme, the major themes that we um, uncovered during this process. There's um, financial burden, insurance barriers. Those were not different from the last study. Uh, disability insurance, that's a new one because of the, the nature of this um, disease and what happens to a lot of people and their ability to work. Um, the desire for palliative care and, and the lack of understanding of that, uh, the need to get access to more clinical trials, um, 
information and communication barriers, navigation and support services again was a theme from the first one. And then the social risk factors remained largely the same, but still play a big role for this patient population. So the financial burden, cost of treatments and medications is expensive for, for most any disease, but when you get into this disease that you're that many women battle for years and years, there it just adds up so much. Um, the cost of insurance and maintaining your insurance, especially if you have to move off of being able to work. And then the indirect cost associated with what you need to do to get access to the care. Now, throughout this presentation, in our report and in our fact sheets, we share a lot of the direct quotes that our key informants gave us because we really feel like their voice is very powerful. And so I hope that um, you will have time uh, to go through the report and listen to what these women are saying about their experience. And the, in this case, the financial burden that is uh, very stressful for so many of these patients. Our next theme was insurance barriers. We talked to women who had different types of uh, private insurance and were on public, um, public uh, insurance programs. And while the, there was maybe some nuanced challenges, all of them mentioned that there were challenges with, the, with getting um, the, the best benefits. Uh, most of them talked about needing to spend a lot of time and energy to advocate for themselves and advocate for the type of um, benefits that they wanted. For example, access to holistic care is not a universal, uh, not universally covered. And so there was a, some frustration on the parts of, of some of these women that they wanted to take control of, of what they wanted their care program to be, but couldn't necessarily follow what they or their physicians wanted most because of some of the barriers thrown up by insurance companies just getting um, access, getting pre-approvals, getting uh, the, the saying, having a doctor say, this is, this is the course of treatment, this is the medication I want you on, but your insurance company says, you've got to try this medication first before they will approve that. And there was a great deal of frustration on the behalf of patients who have to, you know, they feel like they pay in, they, they, they have this insurance, but they really, test the limits of the coverage and the, um, the limits of what they can really uh, get access to based on some of the barriers. Uh, and that was across the board, again, whether or not they had, they thought they had really good employee sponsored insurance or whether or not they were in a more public program. Disability insurance, as I mentioned, this is something that is kind of unique to this group in that many of them get to a point where they cannot uh, continue to work full time. And so a lot of them uh, expressed surprise that uh, when they found out about their ability to qualify for it, it was way later than they should have known. And there was this just desire of why doesn't somebody tell you about this, that it's possible that you're going to need this, you have a right to it, and make sure that you can get connected to it. So there was some frustration about that. Palliative care. This, uh, this we heard uh, was a major discussion at the conference and then echoed among our key informant interviews that there is a, currently a, a misconception about palliative care. And a lot of people felt it was both on the provider side and on the patient side. Many equated it to hospice care. And you, oh my gosh, you think this is, this is, they're telling me this is my end. This is the, the final stretch and I need to go into hospice. But that's not what palliative care is. It is, a, it is charting a course to help alleviate pain, which a lot of different um, suffering that can be managed better <clears throat> if you can get connection to services. And so there was this uh, frustration that people didn't know what it was, that physicians weren't um, including it in their care plan in all of the other things that a metastatic breast cancer patient has to um, 
do for their course of care, that palliative care wasn't automatically put in. And those that did have it and those that um, were aware of it were so appreciative and felt uh, that they wanted to share the message of, wow, other women need to know about this and have access to it. That I think that quote very much says it all. Uh, about when it from one of our key informants who then got into care and then once she understood what it was was so appreciative and so thankful that she had been connected to it so these last three themes are ones that the california breast cancer research program has now tasked us with really focusing on and um do, doing expanded um dissemination of of these uh, particular barriers and potential solutions among the groups that can act on this. So one thing is access to clinical trials. This again, major co topic of conversation at the conference and something that a lot of the key informers, particularly the patients, really didn't know much about. Those that did though, it described the links that they went to to get access. One woman literally flies across the country to Boston to participate in a study that she qualifies for. And she acknowledged that she is very lucky that she has um, the uh, time and the financial resources to be able to go and participate in that because it was the one trial that was best for her, her specific individual circumstances. And she felt badly that more women didn't have that option, uh, didn't have one uh, necessarily one that uh, was local to them and didn't have maybe the financial resources to be able to participate. There is a lot of confusion about, and when you enter a, cl a clinical trial, who pays for what? What gets covered because you're in the trial? What does your insurance pay for, even though you are maybe interacting with doctors who are not on their plan? There's, there is a lot of opportunity here um, to improve uh, information about and, and uh, support connection to clinical trials. Um, so again, they, you know, they talked about getting connected and then being able to get enrolled in a trial, how important that is, particularly for people who, for whom something about that trial may be the only option for them to really uh, have a chance to live long with this disease. Communication and information. There was, um, when you when you hear when you when you hear the words cancer, and when you hear further that it has metastasized, a lot of people do fear that that is a death sentence for them, and it consumes them as a patient. That's a difficult to uh, reconcile when you may not have much time with a prov any one provider. So they really were hoping that. Um, that they could, there could be more training for physicians and other staff, because you interact with a lot of different office staff, um, to, to, to really un, have an understanding of what patients are going through, and then really help in uh, with, with empathy to connect them to all of the things that they need. So there was a great desire for improved communication and information. Again, navigation and support services. There, especially when you have metastatic breast cancer, you suddenly have a long list of providers and places that you need to go to get to treatment. There are a number of support services out there that can help with addressing the needs to navigate all of this, but there is a disconnect between a lot of the patients and the ability to access those services. So there is a, um, like I said, there were some women who after going through it themselves started 
their own support service groups to fill a need, to try to, uh, you know, do it for themselves and do it for other women, knowing what they were going through. Um, particularly in some parts of California, uh, access to the nearest chemotherapy center was more than an hour drive. And chemotherapy is not something that you walk out of the office from and you know you necessarily feel like you can then drive yourself home for another hour. So transportation and potentially lodging, if you uh, you know need to stay overnight to access care, these were surprising issues that we found. But in a lot of places in California, there are gaps in service providers, the number of service providers, and so this is something that um, we heard from su a surprising number of people that would be helpful. Uh, for them to have. Also, the connection to other metastatic breast cancer patients, um, those who had it really said it made a world of difference to be able to speak to somebody else who really understood what you were going through and what you were going to go through, what you should prepare yourself for. Uh, they, uh, those who had that really um, said it, it, it was just so not only just emotionally helpful, but it really gave them perspective to make plans that they didn't know that they needed to make. Very important services that uh, uh, they were, that they feel like every patient should be connected to. There is unfortunately, uh, because of HIPAA privacy rules and other legal issues, challenges between getting health systems and these outside support services to be able to share information and work together. And so like, that's an acknowledged challenge that a lot of people have, but they, they still feel like there should be a better way. <laughs> there should be a better way of making those connections. Social and risk factors. Uh, Again, we have a very diverse population in California, and there are some uh, populations in which talking about really sensitive health issues is very taboo. There are also populations that uh, their for their English might not be good. Their English co comprehension of medical terms is even more challenging, and the the sudden. Uh, new medical terms that uh, will be discussed with you when you are a metastatic cancer patient is lengthy. And so just being able to process that kind of information, not to mention then try to go and seek information for yourself is a big challenge um, for a lot of, of people. It's one of the reasons that um, we put, try to put out our uh, policy briefs in multiple languages because we don't want anyone to miss out uh, if we can um, help that. There, one of the uh, providers that we uh, spoke to, she speaks multiple languages and she gets pulled in a lot of directions because they know she speaks so many languages. Anytime there's a patient that comes in the door of that, you know, for which English is not their first languages, that she spends a lot of her time just trying to help them navigate and find resources. But she is one doctor, and she, that is, you know, unfortunately, uh, a, a big burden that they already have to just just to be a doctor. But then also ha to have to be an interpreter for so many people is an additional burden on a lot of uh, providers, um, and hard to find if you are the patient to necessarily know where to go to find that provider that can speak to you in language. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Glenn, who uh, during this process, as I mentioned, we uh, not only listened to these um, patients and providers talk to us about the barriers they face, but we gave them the opportunity to say, here's what I need to fix this. <laughs> Here's what I want to do. And some of the ideas were very pie in the sky, but some of the ideas were very pragmatic and we want to put them forth uh, as recommendations um, to the people who can act on them and hopefully break down a few of these barriers. Dr. Glenn, I turn it over to you. Thank you. 
So next slide. So the first policy recommendation we had was to help provide financial assistance for cancer treatment and support to, to patients that need it. So we know that even insured patients have costs that they didn't anticipate and are, that are not covered. We know this, this is particularly true for support services. And then even then, of course, many patients um, don't have insurance and don't know where to go to, um, to receive the best care and, and to get that covered. We also think it would be beneficial and heard it would be beneficial from women we spoke with um, to help with planning for the costs of cancer treatment. So many times women are actually unaware of what they're gonna end up being uh, responsible for. And so whatever, whatever can be done to help them understand what the costs will be and plan for those costs in addition to the support would be very helpful. Um, and we found that there's a, a special need among women that have high deductible health plans, we know that they face the highest out-of-pocket costs for metastatic breast cancer. So this is a, a particularly needy group. Next slide. So the disability insurance issue, so something that's very important for this population. We know that there are actually some occupations and some women that actually, um, because of their occupation, do not pay into the state of California's disability program. And so therefore they cannot draw on that program. But this is often something that, that women or men, or men even um, don't know um, about and don't actually realize this implication until it's time for them to need the disability insurance. So you know, trying to figure out how can we help people that don't have access to state disability programs and trying to make sure that there are programs in place and policies in place to make sure that women are aware of um, the need for disability insurance, you know, early on in the process that we can help them actually sign up for programs that they may be eligible for. So, you know, more assistance in that, in that area. Um, we also have heard there's really amazing networks of advocates that are helping each other out and figuring out, you know, how do you apply for disability? How do you get it? What is the next step? But it would be great if we could have policies in place so that all women can have access. So improving communication and information dissemination is also, of course, really important. And we feel that policies are most um, necessary regarding end of life care options, including advanced care directives. So we definitely heard um, from stakeholders that this is really a gap in really understanding and communication you know, about um, the care process. We think that patient navigators, and we've heard this from, from many stakeholders, patient navigators may be a way to facilitate this communication and actually help um, women with metastatic breast cancer and their decision-making for treatment, but in particular for what are the support services they need, how can they get them, and then palliative care and end of life issues. And of course, very important to actually tailor our programs to serve the neediest um, cancer survivors, so uh, minorities, immigrants, and low income groups. Next slide. So, you know, patient navigation and support services. I was gonna go over that a little bit more. Um, that was something we heard from, from you know, basically the Twitter chat. It's something that we heard um, during, our, um, during our stakeholder um, interviews. And um, we feel that, um, you know, in, in the past, we have thought of patient navigation as really being something that um, happens at the clinical site that happens in person. But I know that we've all got a lot of um, familiarity this year with virtual technologies and how those can be used. And so we think that perhaps moving forward, it's really important to think about how we can use um, virtual navigation. And that might be a way that we can provide navigation to more people. Um, we, it's important that these navigation services are culturally appropriate and available in patients' preferred language. And then also um, really important to figure out how can we provide patient navigation to all women. So right now we know that navigation is really provided through a patchwork of, of different venues. You know, some women are able to access patient navigation because of the health insurance they have. Others can access it because of where they receive their clinical care, but it would be wonderful if we could put policies into place that provide some level of navigation for all women, you know, no matter, you know, where they get their care or the type of insurance that they have. So related to the social risk factors, um, I think that AJ touched on this, 
but there is and there is this um, issue that we really need to think about what is the neediest group um, when we're when we're um, you know putting forth any policy and how can the policy attend to that group's specific issues. So, for example, um, to better serve limited English proficiency communities, um, you know, one small step that our, that we took was you know making the um, making the um, fact sheets available today, and we're able to do that in English, Chinese, and Spanish. But you know, again, um, a lot of time programs start, um, you know, they start a program, they make services available in English, um, and the, and there's always there's a delay for providing um, programs and materials in additional languages. And so, how can we um, make sure that we plan in advance and build this into the system so it's equitable from the start. I think I covered, I know someone asked to cover um, the content of slide 33. I think I did, just did that. Um, so hopefully I covered that. Um, can you go to the next slide, AJ? So as um, Dr. Ponce mentioned, and I believe as AJ mentioned, these really are the priorities based on our funding agencies um, kind of fitting with our funding agencies, other priorities. So really enhancing palliative care use, um, reducing insurance barriers, and increasing participation in clinical trials. Next slide. So related to insurance barriers. So we heard um, from many stakeholders and you know, at the conference we attended, um, I believe in the Twitter chat, um, concerns about the delays that are caused by the need for prior authorizations, insurance authorizations, as well as a requirement for step therapy. So the idea that you need to go through certain therapies and fail those before you're going to be approved to receive additional therapies. And of course, this is an issue of concern for everyone that has cancer, but it's particularly important and critical for patients that have metastatic cancer. Um, they need to access treatment in a timely fashion. Um, they, um, there's, there's a myriad of different treatment options and often the decisions may be made more quickly than they're made in early stage cancer where there may be more of protocol driven um, treatment. So um, we have heard of a number of um, you know, bills being introduced and passed in other states. And so that hasn't happened yet here in California but there's definitely a lot of interest in doing so for especially for, for women that have late stage cancers and late stage breast cancer in particular. Next slide. So here again is one of those quotes that I really think speaks to what we heard from stakeholders. So, you know, we've heard these before, but the concern that the insurance company is putting up, um, you know, too many barriers and not allowing um, the clinician to have enough, um, you know, decision-making power. So, you know, palliative care is another really important area for policy, um, making sure that um, providers receive whatever information they need to know what to refer their patients to, what services to prefer, refer patients to, to make sure they have the time and they're actually reimbursed for their time to actually inform patients about their options, as well as refer them to existing services. We also know that going hand in hand, if we think about palliative care, it's about helping um, patients with symptom relief, with pain relief, um, it's important to put processes in place so that there's a routine way of collecting data from patients about how they're feeling, about their pain management, about their symptomatology, and that um, in doing so, um, then we, we providers have a better idea of knowing when they need to um, refer patients to these services. Um, we also know that in California, we actually have um, reimbursement through Medi-Cal for home-based palliative care. But we, it's been noticed, it's been noted prior um, that this is not used at the level we would expect, um, and that maybe patients aren't being referred to it. Um, and so, you know, trying to improve awareness of this availability for low-income women um, would be really important. Um, we also found that there are gaps in geographic access to care, especially hospice care. So parts of the state where there really isn't um, the capacity that we need um, for this care for women. Next slide. Um, and so I think one of the issues was reimbursement for, for providers is important, but also um, education and training for providers, but also education and training for patients. So again, making sure that women that have metastatic cancer, you know, hear about palliative care, hear what it is and what it isn't, um, and hear about that earlier on in the process so that they 
um, are able to um, utilize it when they feel they're ready and when they feel that they need it. Next slide. And here's another great quote from one of our key informants. Really suggesting how important it is to let women know about, um, about um, palliative care early on in the process. Next slide. Thank you. And then another area really ripe for policy implementation is improving access to clinical trials. And so, you know, what policies can be put into place to provide assistance to um, women with breast cancer and metastatic breast cancer in particular um, to cover the costs of trial participation. So we know that, you know, many of the costs associated with um, treatment in a trial are covered, but we also know that other costs are not covered by the trial. They're expected to be covered by the patient's pre-existing insurance, and sometimes that doesn't happen. We also know that patients sometimes need to travel to participate in a trial. Um, they need to park when they get there, so um, they maybe need childcare. So how can we provide more assistance um, with the cost of participating in a trial? And if we can do that, we actually can level the playing field and we can um, allow all women to make an informed decision um, if they're eligible about participating in a trial, even women that don't have as many resources. Um, and also we find it really important to invest in programs to increase participation of patients from underrepresented ethnic minority groups. So black patients, Latinx groups and so on. And so um, this is really consistent with efforts that we're initiating um, and that are ongoing within the Johnson Comprehensive Care Center, um, Cancer Center that are focused on improving minority enrollment um, um, in cancer clinical trials. And we know this is extremely important because we need the findings of these trials to be relevant for all women. Next slide. So again, here is a, is a really great quote, um, a woman just reporting what she thought would be covered um, which wasn't covered um, during her trial participation and how this was really, um, she could afford it, but it was really still disturbing to her. So our plan for dissemination of these findings, um, as you hopefully have seen, we have the report, the full report summarizing these findings is available on the Center for Health Policy Research's website. Um, the fact sheets have been released um, and are available. Um, as AJ had mentioned previously, we are going um, identifying key members um, of the legislature that could sponsor um, policies relevant to our findings. And over the next several months, um, we are planning one-on-one -on -one meetings with the legislative staff um, for, um, for really relevant um, folks, um, the governor's office and health agencies to try to figure out you know, what, what could be some of the next steps in pushing policy forward in this area. Next slide. We just wanted to thank our funder, the California Breast Cancer Research Program. We also wanted to thank our collaborator, Dr. Deanna Atai, who is a faculty member here at UCLA. And she also, she leads the Twitter chats and was gracious enough to, to join our team and to help us with that part and, and other parts of our study. Um, we also wanted to thank Sharon Schlesinger of the UCLA um, County Affiliate of Komen. She's really been instrumental in helping us figure out who we need to speak with and, and getting, um, key informants to participate. And we also wanted to thank all of our key informants and Twitter chat participants who, you know, helped us find people that we wanted to speak with and really just, you know, without whom we couldn't have done this project. So now we have time for Q&A. Hello, everyone. My name is Tiffany Lopes and I'm the Director of Communications here at the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research. I'm going to be going through audience questions today. So if you do have any questions, please use the Q&A function in Zoom. Um, so let's get started with the first question. What about racism? Um, it is clear that people of color often encounter racism manifested in such ways as not being offered clinical trials at the same rate as white women. Um, and did you survey men with met metastatic breast cancer who have all the burdens as women plus stigma and dismissal of symptoms? So thank you very much for that question. Uh, we did not specifically include men in this uh, study. Uh, and that uh, was uh, at the direction of the funder. So um, perhaps they will uh, put money 
towards specifically uh, looking into that area, but for this one, we were directed to um, look at the experience of women patients. Um, as for structural racism, we did not lead any of the key informants on the barriers that they experienced. We left it open-ended and then probed more deeply as they shared their experiences. And it wasn't uh, a theme that came up. It wasn't something that the uh, informant said, I experienced this. Uh, we did have one uh, physician respondent uh, who did note um, she or her, she herself was African American, and she did uh, express frustration, uh, particularly within her own African American community, about uh, because metastatic breast cancer does um, require so many appointments with so many different places that um, one of her biggest challenges that she noted as a as a cultural thing was um, follow up among that community. And she expressed a lot of uh, concern that, um, that certain people needed more hand-holding to make sure they got through all the processes, went through all of their follow-up, uh, adhered to all of the things that for, for some of these women is a very big uh, care plan. So she did talk and acknowledge um, the the challenges within that community, but no one else offered that to us as specifically a um, an issue that they felt they had encountered. They unfortunately had enough other barriers to tell us about um, that it just didn't come up. That's not to say it doesn't exist. It didn't come up in our study. Beth, you. did you want to add to that? Yeah, I was just going to add, I know there was a, a mention of the issue of offering clinical trials um, and if that differs by race, ethnicity. So I would say that um, structural racism um, certainly does. We know that it's permeated and affected our healthcare system. So I think some of what we found is that some of the sites that are most often going to be serving lower income and minority patients don't have trials available there. They're not, you know, they're not academic centers. They don't have the resources. The providers maybe don't know as much about what trials are available or the, that would necessitate them needing to leave that clinical site and go to an academic center. So I think that, you know, in that way, it has affected where trials are located. Um, we have found that when trials can be located places that actually do a good job of serving um, low income and minority patients, that patients do enroll in trials. So I think it's really important that we, bring the trials to where the patients are. And that's you know some of what we're trying to do in the cancer center. And I think that um, there's been more of an acknowledgement that this needs to be done. Where can we, can we bring the trials to the people instead of asking people to come to Westwood, for example, or other hard to navigate academic medical centers that typically are the ones that host the trials. Thank you both. Um, did you break down responses by demographic groups, uh, age, race, zip code, and if, so were there differences in the barriers identified? Uh, no, the, the, the aspect that we were more interested in was, um, was how long uh, you had been, how long ago you were out from your diagnosis. Um, and so we, because we really wanted to see whether or not there were differences along the continuum of people who were a year or two into it versus longer term survivors. And, and we talked to some women who'd been living with this for 10 or more years. And so their experiences um, were definitely wiser. <laughs> they, um, <clears throat> the, the ones who, who had were, you know, who had been at it for a very long time uh, had more perspective of the look back and knew what they had gone through and what would have made that easier. Um, but they also were the ones who expressed a lot about needing to advocate for yourselves. They were the ones who had gone and, you know, got on the phone with their insurance companies and fought for the rights of coverage to certain things. They were the ones that, um, you know, really dove into what, uh, to, to educating themselves and trying to make all of the connections that they possibly possibly could with support services. Whereas those women who uh, were maybe only a year or two in kind of didn't know 
and hadn't been connected to those things. And we're like, why can't I find some of these things? Um, and and, it, and it, 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 it spoke to some of the people who saw the need to connect people who have had it for a long time with those who are new to say, benefit from my experience and let me show you how to walk this path in a better way. Thanks, AJ. The Metastatic Breast Cancer Committee of Susan G. Komen, LA County is proud that the seventh annual NBC conference was able to provide support for this study. One of our focuses this year is to be able to connect with the newly diagnosed patient. Were there any special issues presented by the newly diagnosed in your study that should be addressed? Well, th yes, thank you. And thank you, Sharon, for both for your question and for your um, contribution to, uh, to our efforts. Yeah, it, it was really about, um, gaining the knowledge, again, both the health literacy. Women talked about, okay, I, I, I know I wanna be in a clinical trial. I want, I'm gonna go have to go and do the research to find one that I qualify for, but wow, I have to understand all of these medical terms to know which apply to me and then which apply to these studies to even figure out. And for a lot of women that was exhausting on top of everything else that they're dealing with. And so they just gave up. And so I think there's a real need and it's, it's difficult because I can, I can imagine when you, when you first get this information and this diagnosis, your first thing is, is just, what's my care plan? How, how am I gonna beat this? To then have to uh, think about all of these other things is just so much and so much information. And the idea of, of having somebody either just a connection with another patient or a navigator that can help you really get through those things, understand what's coming, find the resources, and then give you time and space to deal with that uh, it is, was really um, a key thing that, we, that, that everybody across the board said would be helpful have. Thank you. Um, this person says, I'm new to the policy side. How do these studies result in change legislation to translate your finding into real world results? So um, as I mentioned, we did uh, the study on the broader breast cancer community in 2018. And afterwards, we had a dissemination plan similar to this one. We went to Sacramento when we could still go in, per in person and we sat down with uh, both legislative offices and some of the office, the agencies in the executive branch and we presented to them our findings. Uh, and part of it was important because some of the findings from our previous study, there are actually laws on the books that they thought, well, that takes care of this problem. And so what we were showing them is, you know, there's a disconnect between what the law says and what's happening in practice. And so it, it, it's very important that perhaps they find ways to um, improve those services uh, and, and, and fix those gaps between what should be happening and what was actually happening in the community. Uh, but we, uh, we did also talk to policymakers. Uh, one of the um, issues that we identified, one uh, Senator Tony Atkins, who I believe is in San Diego, uh, this breast cancer is an issue that's very important to her. And she did file legislation. It did not end up becoming law. I don't know if she plans on filing again, but we, we present all of the option that we present all the barriers that we find. We present the options that, that we have identified as, as potential solutions. And um, we hope that they act on it. Uh, so we, we are talking with Senator Atkins' office again. Uh, we also have other meetings scheduled with um, policymakers and agency folks again this time around. And um, we, we, we hope. We also make all of this information broadly available to our partner networks so that uh, we, we are researchers and educators. We are not officially advocates, but we put this information out there in the hands of advocates who hopefully can then also go and amplify this message and uh, advocate for policy changes. Thank you, AJ. This is really important work. Do you have plans to use virtual outreach for these barriers to those who do not have access to large cancer centers? So that is not something that our research center functions. We're not, we're not providers 
Um, we are just researchers, so um, that's something we would like to see <laughs> maybe happen out in, in healthcare systems, but that is not a function of what we do. Got it. We'll, we'll put it out into the universe right now. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think these recommendations apply to, the pe to people with other types of cancer? Absolutely. Um, they, they, these are definitely not exclusive um, to uh, metastatic breast cancer. Um, or, or, you know, metastatic cancer of, of any type. And a lot of, obviously, you know, anybody who, who's had any sort of long-term chronic issue uh, understands battling insurance companies and the high cost of healthcare in general. So, so yeah, some of these things are very ubiquitous. And some of the solutions absolutely could uh, benefit other areas. Um, this is just magnified through this particular lens, um, but this certainly could be broadened and um, benefit a lot of people. I mean, fortunately, metastatic breast cancer is a small percentage of the population, but some of the changes that we are suggesting would touch millions of people. This is really helpful information. So the American Cancer Society estimates that there will be 284,000 new breast cancer cases in the United States, higher than any other cancer type. Are there any plans to look at some of the barriers to breast cancer care nationally? Uh, if, we, if we had a funder that funded that, that research, we absolutely would broaden this. Our, this funder looked at our directive specifically in California because they want policy solutions and policy at the state level does vary across the country. Um, but we would absolutely be happy uh, to look at, because um, there are other states that have implemented some of the policy recommendations that we put forth in this. And so it would be really wonderful to have the opportunity to go look and see since they implemented that policy change what impact did it have such that maybe that would put more emphasis on it here within this state if we could demonstrate that hey making this policy change can have this impact so let's bring that for our uh, residents in california definitely another thing we're putting out into the universe right um this person says i was curious about your findings regarding the informal navigation networks that formed did you hear anything from your informants about the integration between those informal support networks and patient navigation effort, efforts through the formal medical uh, medical system for example did participation in informal networks help patients connect to navigators within the medical system did informal network participation affect trust in the formal medical system to which patients connected etc so unfortunately, there, that those, those two things are very separate. And as Dr. Glenn pointed out, whether or not you have access to a navigator is dramatically different based on maybe who your insurance is through, because they may offer you one, through where your provider is. If you are within a system that has them, they may offer it to you. Uh, but for example, uh, one of our one of the past patients uh, who experienced who, who noticed that there was no navigation services, she started down in Orange County, a outside of not connected to any any health particular health system, a support service that provides navigation services. And she actually um, noted specifically that once COVID hit, demand for that service went way up because people really didn't know how to, to get connected to the things that they needed. So, but you know, she serves people in Orange County, so that's great for, for Orange County, but that doesn't help the folks that I talked to up in the Lake Tahoe area, where there is a very big uh, provider desert for a lot of the different types of doctors that are involved in this kind of care. And the folks there really struggling to get connected to services up in Truckee, all the way down in the Bay Area, they had a real need there, but there isn't anyone there who's per providing that. So unfortunately, um, those services are a lot of the luck of the draw of what you happen to be connected to. And if, if the hospital system that you go to doesn't provide it and your insurer doesn't provide it, chances are there's not a service out there that you can avail yourself of. And that's very unfortunate. Beth, did you wanna um, chime in? Yeah, I was just gonna chime in. I think that um, 
there has been always um, kind of a, a patchwork of kind of small grassroots organizations to help um, you know, women that are facing breast cancer and then more formalized systems like Komen or um, cancer community, the cancer support community. And I think that now, um, um, you know, both are important and play different roles, but I know that there's been initiatives on, on the part of the larger organizations, ACS, Komen, um, and, you know, the cancer support community. I know there's been more efforts to try to reach out to um, to minority and lower income women. And so hopefully, and more lower income people, men and women. Um, so hopefully, you know, this will also help um, kind of engage more broadly um, women that need care who might not other be, otherwise be connected um, with care, um, with different types of care, or just, you know, learning about these different um, issues that are, that are really necessary for women facing metastatic breast cancer. Thank you both. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions. So uh, next one, are there any groups that locally match volunteer drivers to metastatic breast cancer survivors or volunteer interpreters, or should potential volunteers contact their local cancer centers? So the, the, interpret, the interpreter situation is currently a policy in California that you have um, the right to an interpreter in medical settings. Uh, the challenges that we hear about constantly is having the availability of an interpreter at the time that they are needed. And sometimes the extensive wait times that occur uh, to, to get connected to those services. We, I have had more than one provider tell me that often they end up having a family member just serve as an interpreter because it's there, it's in the room, it's at that moment and, there, and there's no need to you know, have to wait and get connected. Um, the challenge is that having somebody else, a volunteer from the outside come in is that you run up against patient privacy law. And so that's why there is a, a formal network of state approved uh, translators uh, who, who can do that, or interpreters who, who can um, provide that role, but it's not something that just anyone on the outside would be able to come in and fill. That is also an issue with the navigation services that aren't officially attached to a hospital system, is that they're not going to know necessarily what a patient needs because they don't have the right to view a patient's medical records, which is of course entirely understandable. Um, there was, oh, the transportation. Again, that because it's provided by voluntary outside services where those exist, vary. There was one in the Lake Tahoe area and then the people who ran it happened to move and no one stepped in to fill that role. And so um, it is a, again, a product of where you live and whether or not it just so happens that that is available in your community. It is not a um, unified program. Thank you. Um, so just one quick last question and then we can close. Um, this person asks, what are the next steps and when do they occur? So as I mentioned, we are, uh, I think in two weeks starting our um, uh, series of uh, virtual meetings again, with different both uh, folks who work for the legislators and folks who are on the agency side. And we will be both presenting our study findings to them, but then also um, saying, here are some of the ideas that have been found that could address some of these barriers. Do you have others? And then we will be reporting back to the California Breast Cancer Research Program. Um, they and other uh, healthcare organizations in the state would then uh, be the ones to say, all right, here are some initiatives that we want to get behind and we want to um, advocate for and, and put some effort behind. Uh, so our role will be to broadly share this information with directly with the people who are in the positions to um, make and affect policy change. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, those are all the questions we have time for this afternoon. If we didn't get to your question, please email us at healthpolicy at ucla.edu and we will get back to you. I just wanted to thank you all for attending this month's webinar and thanks to Dr. Scheitler and Glenn for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of the day.